Life in Seldovia, slow and serene. Ahead on Frontiers, we revisit a community once at the heart of the fishing industry, now trying to reinvent itself. And a celebration of salmon, why fishing is king when it comes to life, culture, and history in Alaska, and also why we Alaskans love our moms. I love my mom because she takes care of me and she loves me with all of her heart. Words of love, music to a mother's ears, ahead on Frontiers. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program and happy Mother's Day. It's also a special day for us here on Frontiers. We have reached our one year milestone and to mark the occasion, we're bringing you a story that aired on one of our most popular shows in which we took you to Seldovia, a waterfront community on the Kenai Peninsula on the south side of Kachemak Bay, right across from Homer and beyond the end of the road. Seldovia is still an economic frontier with both challenges and opportunities. From Homer to Seldovia, it's only a 45 minute commute, short, but enough time to help you transition to the town time almost forgot. As the whales play hide and seek along the way, the ferry slows down to let the passengers live in the moment. The Kachemak Voyager is a lifeline for Seldovia. It keeps the town's fragile economy moving, making it possible for people to stay in Seldovia. That's the best place on earth in the summer. Russ Gagel and John Gruber are longtime Seldovians, and they worry about the future of the place they call home. And there are folks that are trying to stay, struggling to, to stay, but they're making it. So why do they stay? the beauty of the land and water and spirit of the community. Most afternoons you'll find Brian Slover, a retired vet, playing his wooden flutes. I actually target when we have a high volume of people coming through, so it's basically a big welcome Sodovia type thing. The sound carries across the water. In harmony with Seldovia's blend of rural and urban life, unlike other off-the-road system communities, Seldovia has water and sewer service and paved roads. Although Seldovia also has high-speed internet, the town's nickname for itself, Slowdovia one that's not lost on its new police chief. More chance of getting run over by a local dog than a car. <laughs> There is a leash law here, but no one's told the dogs. Some people call it retired on duty. In the two months Chief Hal Henning has worked in Seldovia, his department has only had about 20 requests for help, mostly minor. In other places he's worked, he's had that many calls in a single day. That's why some people come to Seldovia and come to villages that are smaller is because they want that village life where you can ride a four-wheeler to get to school, or you can ride a four-wheeler to get to the grocery store. The tourists love that feeling of freedom. It's just very <laughs> quaint. It's, it's like all of Alaska, it has no pretension. Nancy and Roger Sohoff are from Georgia. They say the best part about Seldovia, it's authenticity. But they do wonder about one thing. Well, my question about Seldovia is that everywhere we walk, we see for sale signs. Signs that suggest Seldovia's economy is in trouble. Seldovia is, a, is an amazing opportunity for folks who, who want to get away from the busyness of, of big city life. Jenny Chissa says when businesses fold, it's often because of health reasons. Life changes on a dime. One challenge in recent years, business owners who are aging out. Although the Mad Fish restaurant was popular and profitable, the couple who ran it decided to retire. 
With most of the income from the business earned during the tourist season, it's been a challenge to find new owners. It's got an immaculate, beautiful kitchen, commercial kitchen, and it's also got living quarters behind it. Chissa says the loss of any business in a small town like Seldovia ripples out to the whole community. We're big fish in a small pond, and so each of us has an influence, good and bad. There are also other chronic challenges. The community's main grocery store closed, leaving only one to serve the town. The high cost of transportation makes food more expensive, so locals tend to shop outside Seldovia, which keeps new stores from opening up. Still, many believe Seldovia's economy is on the rebound. Some young families have moved to town, bringing with them at least 30 children, most of them too young to go to school, but eventually they'll help to boost its declining enrollment. I came here because I wanted my children to be able to have some independence in a safe and beautiful place. There are several new businesses like Seldovia Fishing Adventures. Brent and Raywin Weir started their combined charter business and bed and breakfast two years ago. There's a nice one. The Weir say it's not easy to run a business so far from the economic mainstream. Everything we bring here is imported, barged, ferried, so uh, it's, it's a bit expensive. Brent Weir also works another job in the winter to make ends meet. But the Weir say it's worth it. Like many in Seldovia, they love the outdoor life and the customers they serve. It's nice to share Seldovia with them. The Weirs are encouraged by other new businesses like the Boardwalk Hotel, which has been closed off and on for the last few years. The new owners added a restaurant. The prospects are really good. We see a lot of growth already happening since we purchased the hotel. Angela Campbell so, and her husband uh, Jeremiah also stay open year-round, long after the tourists are gone. Every community, doesn't matter how small it is, they need to have places where people can socialize. The Boardwalk is now the second largest employer in Seldovia. We employed five people uh, throughout the entire winter. We have 16, 16 employees now. right now. You'll see Angela at the front desk doing all the paperwork. But she also cleans the rooms if need be. Jeremiah also works as a gardener. And he's the maintenance guy, he's the plumber, he's <laughs> yeah. the <laughs> painter, yeah. the remodeler. I mean, it's we wear a lot of different hats. Jeremiah also pilots the Seldovia Bay Ferry in the summer, a job that helps support his restaurant and hotel. The Campbell's niece, Madeline, works in the restaurant as a waitress. I work on the ferry too sometimes. And in between all of that, she launched her own kayak tour business, a hectic schedule. Young people, especially that live here, work three or four jobs just to supplement. Madeline says showing off Seldovia's beauty to tourists is the job that brings her the most personal satisfaction. We'll go up into the slough if we have the right tide. The water tour gives visitors a different, intimate experience, a chance to see the historic boardwalk from the water. Uh, it's just so peaceful out here. You know, there's always the rush of getting everything ready, and then you get on the water and it's just so peaceful. Madeline's new journey has given hope to the community that a younger generation will continue to reinvent Seldovia. So your total comes to 323. Susie Stranick moved from the Anchorage Hillside, and although this gift shop is her summer retirement business, she's glad to see a younger generation, especially kids who grew up here, make Seldovia home. But they do gravitate here because they realize there's something special about Seldovia. You know, something that they haven't been able to find when they were off at school. I think in today's fast-paced world, that's a very unique thing to be able to have community in your life so intimately in this small town. And still to come, we turn our focus to fish, a subject that arouses intense emotions in Alaska. Two longtime Alaskans will help us understand just why this is. Don Reardon and Carol Sturgelewski, contributors to the new book, Made of Salmon. But first, another source of passion for Alaskans, Remembering Mom. 
Here are some of the photos viewers from across the state have shared with us. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium provides comprehensive health services for Alaska Native and American Indian people across our state. In addition to world-class care at the Alaska Native Medical Center, our work delivers health services for rural Alaska. From cutting-edge technology for the best care possible, to modern construction of clean water systems and health clinics, to health training and outreach that honors our culture, our vision is that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. Tobacco hurts everything and everyone it touches. If you do smoke, take it outside. The 2016 Alaska Law Enforcement Torch Run and Pledge Drive for Special Olympics Alaska will kick off on Saturday, May 21st. Law enforcement officers from communities all over the state join in the 5K Fun Run to support sports training and competition programs for more than 2,000 Special Olympic Alaska athletes statewide. Help keep the flame burning. Register or pledge today at SpecialOlympicsAlaska.org. There's an old saying, everybody complains about the weather, though nobody does anything about it. Well, you can't blame a guy for trying. We know you can't change the weather, but you can change the way you look at it. And while you can study all the models you want, eventually, you're gonna have to go outside. Carlos Fora and KTVA 11 weather. Be there. Cut it, smoke it, freeze it, and prepare it in so many different ways. But within all of that diversity, salmon is our common denominator. For many Alaskans, a shared passion. Well, there's a new book of essays out which explores this called Made of Salmon. And joining us to give us a taste of what's in this book, two well-known Alaska writers, Don Reardon and Carol Sturjalewski. Uh, we want to thank you for coming here to share about this book. And Carol, first of all, I want to mention that your father, a lot of people might not know this, is a former governor and senator, U.S. Senator Frank Murkowski. And when he was a U.S. Senator, he was so proud of a book that you had helped compile. It was the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, but this mm -hmm. one was for the gardener. And so you've worked on compilation books before. Right. What do you think of this concept? It's... Uh Obviously, readers really enjoy it. It's, um, you can put a lot of different voices, a lot of perspectives into one uh, piece of material, and you can pick it up, read a little bit, put it down, and come back and have something totally new. Don, how about you? How did you feel about being a part of this project? Uh, it was a great honor. Nancy Lord, the editor, contacted me, and she's, she's one of my favorite Alaskan writers. I just love everything that she's produced so far and when Nancy, Carol and I were talking about this earlier, when if Nancy called you to ask you to do anything, you would do it, you know, jump jump into that lake right there, that glacier lake, I'd jump in for and Nancy. It's quite a lake it is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a, it's amazing the breadth and depth of Alaskan voices in this book are unparalleled, I think, in terms of talking about salmon. Well, one of the things is it's an outgrowth of, of the salmon project. Uh, 
were there were conversations around the state about what salmon means to different communities. And uh, the director of this project calls it a doorway to discovery. A doorway to discovery, a book. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Well, yes, because there are so many voices, there are so many perspectives, there are so many threads within the book and within, um, within Alaska. There's, you know, there's economics, there's politics, there's culture. Um, it's, uh, so a person from one perspective picks this up and reads it and um, is learning about the way other people think and feel and operate and how they raise their family, how they run their business, how they pass on their traditions, how they cook their food. And there is a lot of variety there. In fact, Don, I want to talk about your essay, uh, the one that got away, and it's set uh, on the Kuskokwim River where you grew up. Uh, tell us a little bit about the inspiration for that essay. I guess the inspiration for that, is, I'm playing with that idea of, the, of fishing tales, right? The fish that gets away. And, and I'm thinking more about as a kid when there were so many salmon and we were subsistence fishing for kings and we put our net out and as soon as the net hits the water it's getting just bombarded with giant kings and we have to pull it in before we catch too many. Look at that one. For and a little kid, <laughs> you know, that's almost as big as you. you I was know? a little older then with that one. <laughs> but there's just that idea of, of my son may never get it. That, that's going to be a fish story to him, you know. I hope someday he'll get to see f kings like that again being caught. Um, now, when you went out, of course, you know, there was no threat to king salmon. Uh, you know, they weren't restricted uh, for fishing. Yeah. So different now. I guess it makes uh, those kings even more precious. It makes them so precious. And that's, that's a common thread you see in this book, Alaskans kind of reflecting on their gratitude towards the fish and also the role that fish play in our lives in Alaska. It's, it's not... It's not like outside where fishing is just something that's fun to do. This is what kind of who we are. And, that and, and your essay is that. about the native perspective, the, the Yupik perspective on, on salmon. Yeah, that was where I grew up. That picture right there is Robert Ivan kind of took me under his wing when I was just a little boy in Akyak on the Kuskokwim there and taught me about fish and taught me about the importance of um, respecting the respecting what the land has to give you. So from subsistence, we go to Carol's essay, which is entitled Family Business, and kind of an intergenerational look at salmon in another way. Mm -hmm. Just uh, when I was asked to, to write this piece, my two younger boys had just come off a, a summer working on a fishing tender in Southeastern, and I was also doing some family research at the same time. and just started pulling together all those all those stories and um, conversations with my uncles about their their years as young men working on fish traps for the summer and um, it all just it all just pulled together it's not something that you're really conscious of until you start thinking about this whole made of salmon and how many ways it intersects our lives. And made of salmon can simply be that you've eaten it all your life. And, That's right. And so you are literally all yourselves. You know nothing else, <laughs> and you're happy that way. Yeah, well, here's a picture oh. I love. <laughs> Look at his expression. This is, this is my middle son, who is now 6'5". Um, at our, uh, my husband was getting ready to smoke fish when we lived out in Unalaska, and um, Ted really loved to eat that sweet, sticky salmon. Now, I love one of the lines in your book, and I'm going to, uh, in your essay, the distant ancestors of these fish fed the great-grandparents of these kids and their parents and their grandparents. So this notion that... Uh, these fish were around for your ancestors to eat, and they're the ancestors of the fish you're eating today. An interesting idea. It's, and it's something that cycles through the entire book, through all the essays, is this um, passage of time and generations and fish and continuity. how it happens, continuity, and whether it will continue and how we can make it continue. Now, one of the other threads in the book is gratitude. Can you talk about that? Um, 
I noticed that there is this recurring message in this book about people being thankful, people saying thank you to the first fish. And it's not a native thing. It's not a regional thing. It's, um, it's people just being so happy when you pull that first fish in and saying, there's a, can I read this? This is a, a, a woman from uh, Anchorage. Darn, where is it? Sorry. Um, Christy Everett, who writes, and when you finally catch a fish, you cheer and dance around the net. Thank you, you tell the salmon. Thank you. And I think anybody relates to that, that excitement, mm -hmm. um, that gratitude. And, and seeing it on the Kuskokwim River <laughs> firsthand. Yeah, yeah. It's the, 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 the image that I have in the book that I kind of end with is just this idea of there's this giant king that I can reach down and grab and pull him in, I've already got a whole boatload of them, and he gets away. And there's that idea that sometimes we have to let him go. We have to let him get away if we want him to come back. And that is a very painful realization that, that we've had in Alaska in recent years. I just want to read something that I love, because there's all kinds of little tidbits there, some little poems, and this one is called Humpy Heads. Onions, carrots, and eyes afloat in fishy broth. Soup that sees you back. That's from uh, Thomasina Anderson Cordova. Now, we have a lot of well-known uh, writers in this book, from Heather Lende to Seth, Seth Kantner, uh, lots of people, Julia O'Malley, mm -hmm. lots of people we read regularly. But, you know, it, it's also some of those other voices that are special. Are, are there any that uh, stand out to you? Yeah, one of my um, high school friends, Mary Sattler's in the book. She has a <laughs> passage in there, and I fished with her. You know, like, it was a great little gift to open up the book and see there she is in there. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of Alaskan writers in here, but there's a lot of just Alaskans with their voices too. That's and great. And they hold, they, they stand on par with all the other ones. Oh yeah. And the, the, the woman in Seward who throws her line in and catches a fish right away and these other people who've been out there for hours with fancy equipment are looking at her like, really? <laughs> yeah. That's such a common story. Gosh, we've got so much more to say. And uh, Carol, you and I will be having a conversation on the web. So thanks for joining us, Carol Sturgelewski, Don Reardon. And also coming up, we are going to continue appreciating our moms. She's always encouraged me to do things that I never thought I can do. What young Alaskans from Unalakleet reveal might come as a surprise, not just to you, but mom as well. I just want cremation. Cremation specialists in Alaska. Can I have a service before cremation? Our staff is committed to serving your needs. I just want something basic. The simpler, the better. Specializing in simple cremations. Whatever your reasons are for choosing cremation, call Cremation Society of Alaska, 277-2777, or in the Valley, 373-8627, and on the web at alaskacremation.com. I thought I was the only person who didn't know how to drink appropriately. Alcohol was a best friend for years, and eventually it stopped doing that. I just knew I had to quit. I needed to be there for my children. My day one was May 22nd. My day one was... Day one for me. My day one. My day one. Day one. My day, day one, one was, was May 22nd, September 29th, 2007. 2007.
Do you feel anything? She's dancing. Help protect your baby. Download the free Count the Kicks app. Studies show that regularly monitoring a baby's movements helps reduce the chance of stillbirth. Count the Kicks. Visit countthekicks.org. Football games never break out at the office. Hockey games either. Turns out covering sports in Alaska is not for the weak of heart or back. Reading highlights from sports feeds, easy. Getting the words out at 45 below, try it sometime. Dave Goldman goes the distance for every Alaska sports fan. Like him, KTVA 11 Sports and Dave Goldman. Be there. Next week on Frontiers, we find out why sea ice is so important to seal hunters in Unalakleet. The ice was thin all winter, and this spring it cleared out more quickly than anyone can remember. Hunters shoot seals at a distance and need ice strong enough to stand on so they can recover their catch and butcher it. Seals also like to haul out on the ice, but without it, they were scarce in numbers as well. If I want to go swimming to get to him, I can, but I, <laughs> I don't want to swim after one. I can't even ice hop. It's just too thin. It's just been too warm to even think about it. The lack of sea ice also shut out Unilaclete's winter commercial crab season. Also next week, a look at how the lack of ocean ice makes communities like Unilaclete more vulnerable to fall storm surges. Why life without ice, not just in Unilaclete, but across the Arctic, could be the new norm. But we also took some time out to have some fun in Unilaclete. Please we were invited to the middle and high school spring concert on Tuesday night where there was no shortage of very proud moms and kids who were also proud of them. I love my mom because she can cook for us. She can bring us up river to go fishing. I can spend time with my mom and she'll understand and I could go to her with all my problems and she'll just help me solve it and I'll have a great day. I love my mom because she takes care of me and she loves me with all of her heart. She's always encouraged me to do things that I never thought I can do. The kids in Unilakli really seem to enjoy sharing their music, one way to thank their moms for all they do. One thing they mentioned a lot, though, was how much their moms do to help gather and prepare foods from the wild. And from all of us here at KTVA Channel 11, a happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. It's great to celebrate this along with our first anniversary of Frontiers. Like mom, we do it all for you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.